Welcome to the Exxon Magazine podcast. Dive deep with us into the mesmerizing world of immersive tech, where we bring you conversations with the trailblazers of XR, AI, and spatial computing. If you're curious about what's on the horizon and eager to be inspired, you're in the right place. Tune in and let's explore the digital frontier together. Today, we're speaking with Annabel Bacano, who is a violinist, cultural manager, and entrepreneur in the field of arts and technology. She studied violin at Mozartium University Salzburg and business at LMU Munich and King's College London, and has worked as a consultant for cultural strategies. Annabel is the co-founder of Atopia Space, the Metaverse for Art and Culture, and aims to solve the problem of cultural accessibility together with 15 world-renowned partner institutions by providing a platform where all museums, galleries, and stages in the world can be experienced in VR. She has been a frequently invited speaker for digitization in the arts, for example, at the Belvedere Museum, the University Ludwigsburg, or the University of Basel, and advises clients such as the Bavarian Parliament on their cultural strategies. This sounds amazing. I'm super excited about this episode. I can't wait to begin. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Annabel, for being here today. I'm super excited. We all want to hear about Atopia.space and all the amazing things that you're doing. How is everything going in Munich, by the way? Oh, it's way too warm here and we have like a heat wave. But apart from that, um, lots of good things upcoming. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much. That's amazing. Yes. So, okay. It seems you are, of course, pretty young. You've been creating all of this amazing business. We'd like to know a little bit about your background. What's your story like? I believe stories are very powerful and because we're humans we're driven by stories so please let us know about yours sure um well originally i come from the classical music side so i used to be a violinist since i was five years old i even started studying um by the age of 15 um in salzburg and yeah just loved classical music and all forms arts and culture however at some point i decided to not become a professional violinist but instead um, combine my passions in both music or culture in general with um, business and management because I honestly just thought that the impact I can have on the industry can be much higher in this way. So I started studying business um, as well, worked in the intersection a lot. I worked in PR for classical music, in a consultancy specialized for cultural institutions. And um, in the past few years, I've also been working as a self employed employed consultant um, for um, parliaments, for instance, the, term, uh, the Bavarian parliament, or also some other institutions, basically advising them on cultural strategies or digitization. And I've also built up a, a NGO in the art sphere. So it's it's all been about this combination. Um, and since one year or a bit more than a year, um, I've been building up Atopia. Wow, such an amazing journey. I guess it's a beautiful intersection when we can take a form of art and we finally get the realization that in order to bring it to people, there are other functions or other methods that we definitely need to learn, which is uncommon because usually in the artistic side, we are very concentrated in the improvement, enhancement of our own skills, right? As artists. But there is another component that either Somebody does it for us, which is difficult and very, super expensive, or we actually learn how to promote ourselves in the way that you did studying business. That was such a great move. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, an insightful piece right there. So how did your experiences at the Mozartium University, it's like Sa Salzburg and King's College, shape your perspective at the intersection of art and technology? Did, did, did it have some influence for you or how did that work? Oh, it definitely had strong influences. I would say that the, the aspect of technology came pretty late in my life. Um, but my whole passion and, and the mission that I have that is driving me still today basically came from the time when I was very intensively playing violin in Salzburg. We had... Um, 
often we had concerts for big crowds and in Germany we have the saying I don't know if I can translate it right um of the silver sea which basically relates to playing on a stage in front of only an audience that is usually above 70 years old and which for me was always very strange I was super young I, I was so passionate about it and and I couldn't understand why not more young people would uh, choose to visit these forms of events and now I have to say culture is more than just classical concerts it can be so much um but for me this was maybe the first realization from the violin career that led me into these other intersections and then in business you obviously don't do anything with arts for instance if you study that um but still you learn so many things so you can very very well relate to the artistic industry and the cultural industry so for me, it was really like learning these both extremes, like the, the art extreme, I would say, and the business extreme in university and then bringing them together in my practical experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing, that's an amazing breakthrough that you went through there at discovering, okay, maybe technology is also something that I can incorporate and, and even enhance because these professions seem to be very traditional, classic. I myself... I'm engaged sometimes in taking ballet and I attend ballet events and I notice how the audience tends to be a little bit, I mean, beside the families of the dancers, of course, the audience enjoys those events are mature, more mature people. And I've also wondered the same. Thank you for sharing that. It's a, it's a, like a phenomenon. Um, it's, it's, I think very valuable to create this type of experiences where other crowds also can enjoy this if they don't know how it is. Somehow they might imagine that it's something boring or, or that haven't developed certain appreciation for the art. But I think that um, this medium, for example, these technological mediums are a perfect way to try to bring this type of um, arts or you know performing arts, et cetera, to uh, a wider audience. So... Of course, so at some point you had this idea, I think I want to create something in this field, let's say museums, galleries. How does what break through that moment where you say, yes, that's it. This is exactly it. Like, no, why not any other thing? But why that one? I guess it has some influences from you, but I like to hear directly from you what, what is um, what was um, the time there. Uh, the idea came after attending a conference on for cultural actors and one of the main questions that these cultural actors asked themselves in the discussion circles was how can we make digital content that is not boring <laughs> like digital mm -hmm. content is actually an experience and um my now co-founder CTO um Valentin um I've known him for five years already we basically moved into the same Fletcher at some point and mm -hmm. he's been a full stack developer who's been focusing on the next iteration of the internet or spatial computing mm -hmm. um for the past two years um mm -hmm. but also worked for huge clients before mm -hmm. um we we basically had a talk on the train ride back and brainstormed about how can we make digital true experiences happening and the very very quickly we came to the answer that through this spatial social um sense or the metaverse how we called it back then and um, we can actually make true experiences possible and by that increase a lot a lot of factors to the better for institutions for instance you can make institutions suddenly accessible to everyone at this point you have these let's say museums that usually have certain specialization or have topics that are of interest for people around the world but they only can reach the people that are mm. um, ultimately in the city they're based this can be changed you also have accessibility problems you have many people that don't have access to anything um culturally related close to them you have younger generations that are sometimes even a bit scared because they in a concert fund so they, they don't know what to wear they don't know how to go there and there's studies showing that the main issue why a lot of young people don't go into concerts or tend to go less is because they feel like it's not part of their realities so by bringing these actors into the realities of young generations we can make it more accessible in many many ways and there's lots of more benefits for it but it was basically the starting point where we started to work on Atopia. 
Yeah, that's great. So in your own view, how does this virtual reality technology, although I know it's not the only way to experience Atopia that is space, uh, but let's say VR technology or mixed reality technology revolutionize cultural accessibility. What do you think um, about that? How, how does it revolutionize it so people understand what is the impact of this? Um, the impact of Atopia itself or of mixed? Y yeah, yeah, in terms of okay. allowing, yeah. So what Utopia is, is basically a platform on which you can experience all the world's museums, galleries, heritage sites, concerts, or cultural events. Everything that's kind of related to arts and culture um, will be made accessible there for consumers and in stunning visual quality with great partners across the world and in a very interactive and social way. So just imagine you as a user, you can either open um, the, the app on a simple browser or you just put on a VR headset if you have one and open the app and you can choose from all the offers that we have and engage and discover new parts of the world entirely. And we're basically a B2B2C platform. So we operate with both consumers and institutions. For institutions, we allow a very easy way to access all the technology that is necessary for them. There's obviously there's a lot of generalist platforms um, out there, but they're often not really suiting to the needs of cultural institutions. For the first part, because of just strategic questions. A lot of institutions don't want to be um, sharing a platform with, for instance, pure marketing or branding endeavors, but also technologically speaking, there's just a lot of features that are really necessary for institutions, but don't really make sense for anyone else. So for them, we we just basically provide them with access to a well-working backend so they don't have to develop anything in that regard themselves. And for the users, we just provide a new way of discovering because you have so many existing experiences from cultural institutions in the VR or XR space. Basically, the, this industry has been probably one of the first that started working with VR when it came out. However, they're often um, really segregated across so many platforms and it's usually in impossible to find a good summary of all of that so we want to increase the discoverability and unite all of these platforms or all of these experiences on one platform mm -hmm. thank you that sounds very interesting there how you decided yeah particularly for I imagine orchestras opera theater that's that's already fascinating when you were developing the platform, what were your more like biggest challenges? I know always there are so many, but what were the most relevant ones and how you were able to, with your team, to overcome them? I think, tech, yeah, technically it's obviously a huge project and um, good management or good project management and roadmaps have been proven to be really, really effective. But I think the most important problem at the beginning is just we didn't have any resources. It was just my co-founder and me. And I unfortunately cannot really program. Um, I'm not a person that made all the partnerships that we already have and everything else. So there was literally one person building this. Um, but unfortunately, uh, fortunately, at this point, we just announced a, a funding round with really amazing VCs and angels also that will allow us to hire a few more developers and hopefully speed up the process. Wow, that sounds super exciting. We're going to collaborate with that and putting it everywhere that we can to help out, to spread the the voice of your um, uh, raising funds. So that's great. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, I understand your, your project is so, so amazing, very, 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 you know, it involves a lot of technicals. And of course, you were doing the partnerships. How has been for you the experience of reaching out to them, considering these fields have been a little bit on the traditional side, right? As we were saying, sometimes the audiences are even a little bit of mat mature audience. So how do you approach them and say, hey, now I have this amazing thing when they have been very more familiar with traditional methods of publishing their own spaces? How has been that experience? Well, it is definitely not a sector that is easy to reach, I would it say. Is. Just the people, and that's the beautiful part of this industry and the reason why I love working with it. The people are usually extremely intrinsically motivated. Um, mm -hmm. You have to know that the average persons working in, let's say, museums are very, very well educated. Mm -hmm. They often 
PhDs, but um, the salary is really bad, honestly. Um, so they really work there because they're so passionate about what they're doing on average, N not everyone, but most of them in my experience. So um, also, if you reach out to them, if you work to them, they, they don't operate to make profits. Usually mm -hmm. they operate to fulfill other kinds of goals. So I think for most, I I've seen lots of startups that also try to work in the culture sector with different technologies. And often they had a very, very tough time because you cannot do sales to cultural institutions in the way you would mm -hmm. do sales. <laughs> maybe the rest of the business world um but you really have to focus on the problems that you're solving for them and the problems that are actually important to them for instance yes institutions can earn money with us but much more important for many of them is that they can reach their accessibility they can fulfill the actually um the the mission that they have to be accessible to as diverse groups as possible they can finally display all of their collection elements. You know, in, in average, a museum only displays 5% of the total collection. You can even talk about topics. And my, my co-founder actually wrote a bachelor thesis back then about um, the potentials of the metaverse for decolonization and aspects like that. So I would say it's a different, like a, a very special industry to work in. And you definitely need to speak their language, which I fortunately <laughs> do. Mm -hmm. um, and usually it's, it's a very tough start in the conversation, but once people understand what the actual problems are that they can solve, they become super passionate and they're, they have amazing ideas. You know, they, um, they usually come up with also a lot of, a lot of the features that we now um, have in our roadmap are integrated because of these sales meetings, because they're really creative and become passionate about it. So mm -hmm. by now we've been working with um, 15 pilot partners, so 15 cultural institutions that basically said they want to be there once we launch. We aim to launch at the end of the year, is <laughs> can't promise, but um, with the live version. And they have amazing reputations. Now we have to, in Germany, the biggest museums on board, basically, we have the Konzell in Mannheim, we have the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra, which basically is one of the, I think, top five in the world. Um, many other amazing, amazing institutions. So it's been going quite well, but it's definitely something you have to uh, think about a lot when approaching. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a, a great insight there. I think other people might have that very question because it seems, sounds like a traditional field or how is that approach? And also because they are very focused on the artistic part. Some of them maybe don't have very, very huge tech teams, particularly in XR. I mean, they might have tech because of the, the performances, but not necessarily XR. So how do they, how do they interact with the platform? How do mm -hmm. actually the platform facilitates for them what they need to do in the platform to use it and to start promoting the museum or orchestra opera etc how, how does that pro how does that process work that's a super super good point and um, at the moment we usually let them work with agencies so we ourselves help them um digitize and create experiences and um, that they can then just upload very easily but um you're talking about a super important aspect because it's also the most important part in our roadmap we aim to implement features that are specifically tailor-made to the needs of this industry and mm. um, that will allow any institution if they have a low budget to create high quality experiences in a very very easy and affordable way but in a way that also is unique customized and um, as interactive as it can be so we're we're working on a web-based builder for that oh that sounds exciting so for everyone to keep an eye on if you're interested in bringing a platform that you maybe know, like a physical space or something, that would be amazing to have that opportunity. Thank mm -hmm. you. So Atopia is all about socially interactive and responsibly making of these experiences. So that means it's open, right? It's, uh, it's not necessarily limited to Europe. Is that my understanding correct? No, that's completely right. Uh, I think the biggest value that we can provide is if we work with as international partners as possible, because let's say for, for the European population, um, the most impact can be generated if we work with, let's say, Canadian museums, mm -hmm. because they might never have been to Canada. The, long, the way is very long <laughs> to come to Canada and vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
bringing Canadians to European places or something completely um, far away. So I think we're we're natively global. And while we started in Germany, because my personal network just happens to be here, and um, that's the easiest way to get into institutions, um, we are currently um, talking to a lot of also US partners or um, yeah, other institutions across the world to form more partnerships globally. Mm -hmm. So also, if anyone's listening here from a, um, a cultural institution in Canada or anywhere across the world, um, we're super happy to collaborate on that. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so, super, super important. After this podcast, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation to see how it could be there and an intersection because that sounds super great. I love culture, art, all of this. So it sounds amazing. So if any of you, as Annabelle mentioned, is interested in this, please reach out. So as a speaker on the digitization of art, because you've been... A, witnessing yourself that transition or actually being at the intersection of both. What are some of these emerging trends or technology that spark your attention or excite you the most? Well, obviously XR, <laughs> that's why I went here. But apart from that, um, also AI is a super interesting um, development in the artistic sense and in the way that we think about philosophically what is art and what makes an artwork an artwork and an artist an artist yeah. uh, this is something I've been having long and mm -hmm. <laughs> never-ending discussions about in amazing circles and um, there's really a lot right now especially in the art industry shifting extremely fast um, and I personally really think this is a super exciting time to be alive but also a super exciting opportunity to be one of the earliest to build something create something new yeah yeah you mentioned something super cool about the the philosophy side of this because traditional artists could experience a little bit of rejection because of the of the tool maybe performing even abilities that might be traditionally done by humans so mm -hmm. But there is certain people in the world, certain artists that have like an open open view of the the opportunities maybe that that might arise for, for for from that. So that's exciting to hear that. And the other point is that I actually envision myself in every museum, big museums in the world. Sometimes we had these people, the guides that help the tours saying, oh, this is a piece from this era, and this is the contextual background, the historical background, etc. I, I, I even imagine myself these artificial, artificial intelligence-driven guides that can support these experiences in the museums, in the galleries, um, even orchestra, theater. <laughs> so that, well, that is- working on that. <laughs> Let's phrase it like that. Yeah. We could implementing for instance um ai npcs basically or ai based curators yes. just trained on the or automatically get trained on the um metadata or historical data of the artworks that get uploaded on a platform and can basically assist you and personalized answer all of your questions because in reality you never really have one curator that follows you around and um, answers you any questions it's also a way that we can make art and art learning much more accessible and exciting so yeah, definitely this amazing intersection on that. Oh yeah. So that, that is what you mean in your platform about consulting and advising as well, or that's another aspect, different aspect. And no, no, it's it's basically a functionality. Mm -hmm. Um it's like an AI powered um oh, yes. that follows you around and helps you. And yeah. as an institution, you can um switch it on or off. Wow, sounds amazing. So Okay, so the, it seems you are going to be launching towards the end of the year, right? Um, <laughs> if somebody at this point has any questions or would like to participate in that first group of experiences that will be enjoying the presence in Atopia that space, how they can reach out or how they can find more information about it? How, how is that? Where can they get a hold of you? I think uh, the best way to reach out is just over my email. That's, um, I, I don't know if it's good to spell it, but yeah, it's okay. okay. Annabelle at etopia.space. It's oh. A N 
a b e l l at atopia.space mm -hmm. um otherwise you can reach us over our website over linkedin we're very responsive on all kinds of channels so mm -hmm. we're super happy to hear from you um and yeah we have a very very great special discounts for the ones that decide to be launch partners for us so it's definitely worth being early in the sense yeah that's exciting we like to promote even more uh, often this because this is about cultural accessibility this might be a new term for some people out there but it's the possibility of experiencing these traditional places in a way that was not possible for me i would love to go and visit all of these places in europe and so as soon as this is ready i like to visit as a user because um, i can have a better informed decision on whether i should go in person to these places or not and that's part of the beauty of this as well like we can make better informed decisions before investing all of this money in a ticket in a plane ticket in a hotel and then finding that maybe we should have been in another place instead. So yeah, that's great. Um, is there anything else that you wish I had asked you today, Annabelle? Um, I think we could probably talk for hours about art philosophy and uh, the potential of yes. art. Um, <laughs> um, but I think it's it's amazing to be in a podcast. Maybe one more thing. We obviously also um currently beta testing. So if there's anyone interested in kind of trying out the platform before anyone else can we have a closed list um so if you go on our website www.etopia.space um you can sign up to test it already wow that sounds exciting that's the, that's the most exciting part i think i i didn't know like there was an early access like that but i think that we should try and uh, especially if you have uh, yeah these places um physical space it, physical spaces that you could uh, try to bring to other audiences yeah thank you so much it's super exciting we're gonna be in a touch of course and uh, we're gonna be sharing all of this amazing story and uh, atopia that is space services with museums performing arts galleries orchestras operas theater so that anybody can connect from anywhere in the world Thank you so much, Annabelle, for this amazing episode today. And if you are watching or listening, please share this episode with one of your family members or friends that you feel that could get a lot of benefit. Thank you so much and see you in the next episode. Bye for now.